and uh, I'm talking about um, joint work with Matthias Ludewig and my PhD students Peter Christel and um, Darwin Merch. Peter um, got his PhD in January here in Greifswald and um, Darwin will graduate in September or October this year. Um, Right, so, so this, this work is uh, on a notion of, uh, on a version of two vector bundles that, um, that sort of emerged from, from the applications we had in mind, namely exactly these twisted K theory and spin geometry and string geometry applications. And I just wanted, uh, in this talk, I just want to explain this notion and um, briefly describe um, how nice it is. So the talk um, is organized on a, on a sheet like this. So it has these uh, four corners. Um, first, I will like explain um, which version of two vector spaces um, uh, I mean. So this is here in the upper left corner. Then um, there is um, a bundle version of this version of two vector spaces. That's exactly the two vector bundles. And then here is a small corner about applications to twisted K theory. I'm gonna, I will have to keep this a bit short and then there is this larger section about applications to um, spin geometry. So I'm going to zoom into this. So this is about two vector spaces. And let me start by saying again or reminding what a two vector space is, at least the, the way we think about it. So a two vector space in, in this talk will be an algebra and the important thing about two vector spaces is just that um, the morphisms are not algebra homomorphisms, but bi modules. So we have seen like several talks already in which this bi category of algebras, bi modules and intertwiners has been used and explained. So I don't, I hope I don't have to say anything about this. Just like a couple of remarks um, concerning the exact framework. So I will always be over a field and the field will always be either real or complex numbers. So all the algebras are K algebras. So in this talk, like everything will be graded. So the algebras are graded, the bimodules are graded, and the intertwiners will be even. So this is like, a, I think a, a small novelty in this version of two vector spaces that, that I haven't seen so much. So we consider everything graded and the reason is just the applications we have in mind. So in twisted K theory and also in spin geometry, everything is graded. So it's natural to, to start with a graded, set, graded setting. And in the first place, everything will be finite dimensional. At the end, there will be an infinite dimensional example, but to keep it easy, let's start with just a finite dimensional thing. All right, so let's start with this. So I, I, I I'll start with some facts about this spy category. So the first fact is that it is symmetric monoidal. So two vect K is my notation for the spy category of algebras, bimodules and intertwiners. And this is a symmetric monoidal category with the monoidal structure given by the tensor product over the ground field K. And this is like well established and there is also not, not so much interesting to say about this. Everything is natural. The interesting thing about this symmetric monoidal structure is that whenever one has a, a monoidal higher category, there are these um, various like things one can like discuss for objects which come in layers. So in the case of bi category, there are three notions of dualizability I can impose on objects. So the first notion, that's the one here, is like the classical notion of dual objects in a monoidal category, which just means that like there is a dual object evaluation and co-evaluation, and they satisfy the zigzag identities here up to a two isomorphism. And this is very easy in this, in our example of two vector spaces, every algebra is dualizable in the sense with the dual algebra just given by the opposed algebra and evaluation and co-evaluation are just A again, right? So A can be considered as an AA bimodule. And then I can like move one of the A's to either to the left, to the left as an op or to the right as an opposed algebra. And this gives me 
um, evaluation and co-evaluation morphism, one morphisms in this by category. All right, so slightly more difficult or more difficult, not slightly dif more difficult, is the notion of full dualizability. So this means that the, an object is fully dualizable if it's dualizable and the evaluation and co-evaluation one morphisms have like an infinite chain of adjoints in this by category. And there is this a nice uh, theorem in the ungraded case by uh, Bruce Bartlett, Chris Douglas, Chris Schumer-Priest, and Jamie Vickery that um, uh, a, an algebra as an object in the spy category is fully dualizable if and only if it is semi-simple. And um, this statement just, he, just, this is just the same in the graded case. So we've checked this and the proof just goes through. So in the, also in the graded setting, an algebra is fully dualizable if it's semi-simple. I'm just sort of telling this for completeness. Um, for the purpose of this talk, it's, it's not going to be relevant. Relevant will be the next third and last strongest not notion of dualizability, namely invertibility. So um, a, an algebra, so a two vector space is invertible. Um, if like the dual, if one has a dual object, evaluation and co-evaluation, and these are isomorphisms in the spy category. And so the question is when is an algebra uh, an isomorphism, so a Morita equivalence from A tensor A to K or A tensor A up to K and vice versa. And it's sort of classical that this is true for the graded central simple algebras, which I will call GCSA in the following. So this is important because the GCSAs, so are something like the two lines in, uh, in, the, in the higher structures. So the lines, the complex, say complex lines and complex vector spaces, the one dimensional vector spaces are the invertible ones. And here the invertible ones are the graded central simple algebra. So that's sort of interesting because that's a classical thing. And I just want to recall how the graded central simple algebras are classified. There is this classical result obtained by combining the work of Wall, Donovan, Kurubi, and Lam also. And so this group of isomorphism classes of graded simple central, graded central simple algebras forms this Brouwer wall group of the field, which is like a graded version of the Brouwer group. And it's like very nice as one obtains this algebraic bot periodicity. So there are eight ones in the real case, two in the complex case. And they're precisely given by the eight real Clifford algebras and the two complex Clifford algebras. Clifford algebras. So that's very nice. All right, that's already everything I wanted to say about two vector spaces. Are there any questions so far? So is it related, um, your notion, is it related to what we heard like last week in Davis talk of this K linear category? Yeah. Yeah. Right, there was, this, there was this talk of uh, David Reuter, Reuter and um, uh, he had in his uh, slides uh, the statement that at least in the semi-simple case, so in the fully dualizable case, this by category of algebras, so two vector spaces in this sense here, is uh, the same, so it's equivalent to this by category of semi-simple, uh, yeah, I don't, semi-simple sort of modules, these certain module categories over vector, so linear, semi-simple linear categories. I think that was, there is an equivalence like this. And so we stick here to this sort of more classical and less categorical version with algebras because it simply better fits into our, to our applications. Yeah, I, I'd like to ask, I've forgotten, where can I find the details of uh, symmetric monoidal bicategories? Um, in, in many sources, like, I, for example, there is a, there is this treatment of Mike Schulman um, using double categories, which I found very nice. And there is also in Chris Schumer Pre's PhD thesis, there is a long, long uh, chapter about them. Okay, thanks. Great, welcome. Uh, yeah. uh, could you please remind us the definition of uh, 
graded central simple algebra? Yeah, so, um, right. So it just means that um, the algebra is, um, so first of all, the algebra is graded, right? And then it's graded central. This means that the even part of the center is the ground field. That's sort of important because the Clifford algebras, for example, are not central. Not, not all of them are central in the ungraded sense. And then um, simple just means like simple as a, as a, as a bimodule over itself. Okay, so it's uh, three uh, separate properties, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so now let me move on to allow the bundle version of this story. So now we want to like discuss two vector spaces in families. And there is a subtlety that, that's gonna be important. So let's look at this. So the first, the first attempt of doing it would be to look at a, the by category where one just separately considers bundles of the objects, bundles of the morphisms, bundles of the two, sorry, or bundle morphisms that are fiber-wise two morphisms. So one would consider like graded algebra bundles over X, that's sort of classical, graded bimodule bundles over X and um, intertwining bundle morphisms. And of course, there's also the sub by category where all the objects are graded central simple. So before coming to these points, I want to point out that these things have been investigated by um, Donovan Karubi, who have looked at these, uh, at least on the level of isomorphism classes, of course, not uh, in the bicategorical setting, but on the level of isomorphism classes, this has been um, looked at by um, Donovan Karubi, and they have classified um, the sort of the invertible um, bundles, so the graded central simple algebra bundles over X, both in the real and the complex case. And they got this nice classification result. So in the real case, there is this factor H0 is Z8, which sort of means that on each connected component, one has one of these eight Morita equivalence classes of graded central simple algebras. Then there is this H1 thing, which sort of comes from the grading and then there is this H2 part, which is also this C2 coefficients. So in the complex case, um, it's, it looks similar, just that uh, here one has degree three cohomology, but, and that's gonna be important, one only gets the torsion part of this degree three cohomology. That's like a familiar thing when one looks at these algebras or in twisted case theory, you always only get the torsion things. Right, so that's sort of not so nice about these two vector bundles that only the torsion three classes are obtained. So let's look at this thing, this comment here on the, on the lower part of the slide. So now one can like regard X as a variable and like um, change X and then say how this bundles behave. And of course they behave like, like a pre-sheaf. So this means if I have a map of manifolds I get a pullback functor in the opposite direction. So, the, so these bundles form a pre-sheaf over um, smooth manifolds. And here is a, the sort of the caveat of this. They do not form a sheaf of bicategories. So they do not form descent. And like this is, um, as I remarked here, so that I not forget to say this, this is like the most important main point of this uh, talk that two vector bundles are not just algebra bundles. They don't form a sheaf. And this is really bad for geometry, right? I mean, maybe for everybody, but for geometry, this is particularly bad because it means that one cannot work locally. That, that's what a sheaf means. One can work, work locally and glue. And that's not possible for algebra bundles. Maybe I have this uh, prepared, this, this picture, what it would mean that the, the pre-sheaf of algebra bundles forms a sheaf. So you'd imagine like open, open sets. Over each open set, there is an algebra bundle. And over on the double intersections, there are bimodule bundles. And on the triple intersections, like there is on the composition of these two, there is a, an intertwiner to this. That's like a sort of the gluing data in this pre-sheaf. And if it was a sheaf, then there has to exist an algebra bundle over the union of the open sets. 
that restricts on each open set to the given algebra bundle via a bimodule bundle. Right, so and yeah, when sort of thinking a bit about this, it, it becomes like clear that this is a subtle point. It's not sort of easy to say if these algebra bundles do form a sheep or not, but I claim not. So the point is in general not. So here is this little lemma that we sort of proved. Um, in the real case, if one considers graded central simple algebra bundles, this does form a sheaf. So real graded simple algebra bundles can be glued along by module bundles. In the complex case, that's exactly not the case. And this also leads to the statement that the general algebra bundles over the complex numbers do not form a sheaf. So for the general algebra bundles over the reals, we still don't really know. So the point I would like to, I mean, this looks like chaotic. Um, and the point I would like to make is that we sort of simply do not care precisely about these statements because we'll just like sheafify anyway. Like we will sheafify all these versions to be sure to get a sheaf. And we do this in the following way. So that's the philosophy. If something is not a sheaf, sheafify. And for pre-sheafs of by categories, it should say here, there's a typo, by categories. There is um, a nice construction due to Thomas Nikolaus and Christoph Schweigert, who just explicitly write down what the sheafification, sheafification of a pre-sheaf of by categories is. And that's what, that's our definition of two vector bundles. Our main definition of this talk is two vector bundle is, so the by categories, a sheaf of two vector bundles is a sheafification of the pre-sheaf of algebra bundles. And in these little subcases like real graded central simple algebra bundles where the thing is already a sheaf, we know that sheafification doesn't do anything to it. So it's okay. All right. So, okay, now, so I, I don't have time enough to explain like first like the abstract construction and then apply it. So I will immediately like explain what the outcome of this definition is. So that's here on the other on the other side. So here's like the explicit thing what a what a two vector bundle is. Let me try to move this like this. Right. Let's destroy. It. <laughs> okay. So a two vector bundle over x uh, is like this quintuple of things. So I just wrote this here to make it clear what it what what kind of structure it is really. So this y and pi. This is like in the picture here that's a surjective submersion over X. That's sort of saying that we sort of localize the situation. And that's like what one does for bundle terms, for example. So then we work over this Y and the next data is over this um, total space of surjective submersion, which could be like a disjoint union of open sets. So then it's like over each open set, uh, there is an algebra bundle, like the things, the things we considered before. And then one can go to this double fiber product here. So pairs of points that project to the same point on X. And there we consider a bundle of bimodules, of invertible bimodules in such a way that over a point here, uh, Y1, Y2, the bimodule relates the two algebras um, over the fibers, uh, the two algebra fibers over the separate points. All right, and then one goes to the double fiber product. So that's very, very similar to this picture I showed before and has to assure that like these transition bimodule bundles that go from one point to another, if there is a third point are consistent. So we require this invertible intertwiner here. And then on fourfold, um, on the fourfold fiber product, we require this intertwiner to be um, associative. So that's our definition of two vector bundle. Um, and the main point of this definition is not that I now now write down an explicit example of it. The main point of this definition is that two like two very familiar other geometric structures are subcases, are both like subcases of this common definition. Namely, the first one is ordinary algebra bundles. So, in an abstract level, this is just saying that. The pre sheaf we started with, algebra bundles, of course, sits like inside its sheafification, right? 
So, and looking at the details, it's as follows. So we have this given algebra bundle over X um, and as submersion, we choose the identity. So I also forgot to write this. So we choose Y to be X and Pi to be the identity. So that also over Y, we can just put A and then the remaining structure is trivial because these fiber products they are all X again. So there is nothing to put. So every algebra bundle is a two vector bundle. Similarly, one can consider bundle gerbs. So what's a bundle gerb? Well, a bundle gerb is exactly the thing that I wrote here. It's also a subjective submersion. Then there is sort of nothing over the Y, so which I now sort of regard as a trivial algebra bundle. And there is this line bundle over the double intersections and this isomorphism mu over threefold intersections. And you see immediately that this is like a, an example of a two vector bundle because like the line bundle L is of course a CC bimodule bundle. That's why I can put C as the algebra here. So that's the main purpose of this definition I gave of two vector bundle. That for the, for the first thing is that it's, it is a sheaf. So one can like work locally as geometers want to do it. It contains algebra bundles and it contains bundle gerbs as examples. All right, so now let's look at this result, which is um, a result of Darwin Merch's PhD thesis, one of my students. And he has classified the two line bundles. So now two line a two line bundle is one of these two vector bundles that I just defined, but where all the algebras, all the algebra bundles are bundles of graded central simple algebras. These are the two line bundles. And Darwin classified them. So again, we have a classification in the real and the complex case. And you see that it's exactly the same as before. So the real case is just the same classification as we had for algebra bundles. But in the complex case, there is a difference, namely this torsion restriction is gone away. So now using two line bundles, instead of graded central simple algebra bundles, we get the full H3. And this is also immediately our proof that the, the previous just great central simple, simple algebra bundles does not form a sheaf because sheafification added something. So it couldn't have been a sheaf. All right, so let's note that these groups are sort of famous because that's the full group of twistings of twisted K theory, including the grading. The grading is like this, it's a so-called grading twist, which is here in H0, so it's included. And like this is like the full set of twistings one wants, one wants to have. So two line bundles geometrically realize these, um, these uh, twistings. And this sort of suggests, of course, if one can like see this directly, and there is this third example of two vector bundle, namely one can take one of Fried Hopkins Telemann's twistings, which are these um, graded central extensions over local quotient groupoids that resolve like the base manifold or base space in the case. Man can like directly write down um, an isomorphism between them and two line bundles in the complex case. Uh, at least um, so sort of when the when the H zero part is zero, and I've seen that Dan Fried also has lecture notes online where he proposes um, um, sort of um, modification of the, the twistings that sort of gets very similar to what we get out of this plus construction and that sort of um, also incorporates this H0 twist. All right. So now I talked already about twisted K theory. So um, we are not far from this little section here about applications. So the natural question one can impose now is, of course, if now the twistings of twisted K theory can be realized like nicely using two vector bundles, can we also like realize the twisted K theory groups geometrically in this model? And of course, there is no like totally satisfying answer um, to um, to, to, to this because it, it is sort of clear that the non-torsion twistings sort of the, the, the twisted K groups will never sort of be simple geometric objects. But at least for the torsion case, 
um, it works here and, and it works in a very nice way. So this is also a result of Darwin Mersch's thesis and um, he sort of um, generalized Karubi's uh, so-called grading description of ordinary case theory to this twisted case. So I'm just sort of displaying this here. It's not going to appear again. So one can take like a, a general two line bundle L and consider a twisted case theory group over X um, where the representatives, the geometric representatives are ungraded one morphisms in the by category of two vector bundles from L to the trivial two vector bundle. So sort of modules, if you want, module bundles. Um, but the point is sort of that they are ungraded and that in order to, um, that, that one has to like keep track of two ways of making them morphisms in this graded world. And then there is an equivalence relation dividing out homotopic gradients. So that's like a, maybe not that familiar, but existing description of ordinary K theory and it generalizes very well to this context. So we've used this. And then Darwin has proved um, a long list of coincidences of this definition of twisted K theory with like other realizations of it. So most importantly, for example, if the, if the two vector, so consider the trivial Clifford algebra bundle, CLN over X, just the trivial bundle, that's an algebra bundle. So algebra bundles are special examples of two vector bundles. So it makes sense to consider this twisted K theory group that I just wrote down. And then Darwin proved that this is the degree NK theory of the original one of Atia Hilsenberg. So this is just saying that this, this, um, the Clifford algebra is using this as a grade, as a twist, just reproduces the, the grading of ordinary K theory, right? So this is in, in fact a sub, sub case of the second case. So when A is a general bundle of graded central simple algebras, for example, this, but now general, then one obtains precisely Donovan Karubi's K theory with local coefficients from 1970. That's what they sort of did with algebra bundles. So we recovered this as a special case as algebra bundles are special cases of two vector bundles. But now one can go into this other corner of two vector bundles, which is like opposite or orthogonal to it and consider a bundle term. A bundle gerb is also a two vector bundle and one consider exactly the same definition of twisted K theory for a bundle gerb. And then one obtains precisely the so-called so bundle gerb K theory defined by Bauknecht, Carey, Mattei, Murray and Stevenson in 2003. So that's nice. And of course, one can now go to this Fried Hopkins Telemann um, twistings and um, like employ this isomorphism to two, vector, to two line bundles. And then in fact, sort of use their axioms. I mean, they realize the K groups in a different way. They first construct a spectrum and then do this abstract algebraic topology thing. But they provide sort of number of theorems and behavior of this. And we can use this in, in such a way that um, one can prove that it's isomorphic to, to what to our geometric way of, of realizing it. All right, so this is nice. And um, so today I won't have more time to, to, to go into this direction, uh, but there would be like time enough for another talk. So for example, so I wanted to explain a couple of um, advantages of this, uh, of this nice geometric realization of twisted K theory. For example, a relative twisted K theory can be realized in more or less the, the same way. It's very easy. Um, then one can write down the tone isomorphism explicitly in the model. So like as an operation on these module bundles, I think this is really a really a great result that I haven't seen anywhere before. Um, the, using the tone isomorphism, one can construct push forward maps. So they for, for I mean, for general smooth maps, there is no like orientation assumption on them. Why is this possible? Because because if the map is not like spin C oriented or something, then by, by pushing twisted K theory, that, that's gonna change the twist in exactly in these H0 and H1 parts of the twist. And because we sort of like these two vector bundles or two line bundles, they like incorporate the full group of twistings. This is now possible in a geometric way because all these change of like H1 twists can exactly be incorporated here. 
Right, and then finally the, the non-torsion twists. Yeah, they're of course complicated. So in Darwin's thesis, we have like followed an approach by treating them as like twisted geometric cycles, sort of like a la, a la Baum Douglas, but I won't have time to talk about this now. I have a quick question though. Um, so the, to, the proof that the Tom isomorphism is actually an isomorphism uh, involves uh, the um, index bundle. And so how do you, uh, how do you uh, in this setting establish the, that it's an isomorphism? Yeah, we use the index bundle and it's sort of, it's sort of you take like a tensor product with the index bundle. Oh, um, okay. To, can we can we like postpone this discussion yes. to the discussion? Yes, yes, you've right. answered the okay, question. Then, Thank then you. Let's talk yes. about this later. Exactly, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah, just because I want in the last like ten or twelve minutes, I wanted to like go through this other like examples which which are in spin geometry. So right. So this is like this section of the talk. And the first, like there was, this is like split in two. Like first I want to talk about classical, very classical normal spin geometry. All right, and because there is like a sort of something that bothered me for a long time about this. So there is, what's a spin structure on a manifold? And to make it easy, let make them, we assume oriented manifolds, like Riemannian oriented manifolds, all right? So what's a spin structure? So the standard like answer to this would be, okay, you take the frame bundle, the oriented frame bundle and lift its structure group to the spin group. That's a spin structure. And that's equivalent by just lifting jerk theory, which is sort of should now be like an established thing. So it's equivalent to saying that you take the spin lifting jerk, which obstructs this lifts and trivialize it. That's precisely the same. It's an isomorphism of categories. All right. So this notion of spin structure is related to this bundle jerk. It's a real bundle jerk over X. All right, and then there is another definition of spin structure that I know from the work of Stolz Teichner. I'm not sure if that's really their idea, but I just know it from there. They say that a spin structure on X is a bimodule bundle between the Clifford algebra bundle of X and the trivial Clifford algebra bundle with the dimension. All right, so how, and now there is this natural question, how are these two definitions of spin structures related? So here's the answer. They are related because all these things live in this bi-category of two vector bundles. For every oriented Riemannian manifold, there is a canonical isomorphism between these two algebra bundles considered as two vector bundles and this lifting gerb considered as a two vector bundle. Now it makes sense to say that they are isomorphic and they are isomorphic canonically. The isomorphism is sort of like a, like a twisted version of the spinor bundle, but exists without assuming that X is spin, right? Because when X is spin, both sides are trivial. So here is like this sketch how these two definitions are related then. If we have this isomorphism from the theorem, and we have a trivialization of the spin lifting jerk, which is like a one isomorphism of two vector bundles like this. Then using this isomorphism here, I get a one isomorphism of two vector bundles like this. And then I just put one of the terms of, on the other side and immediately have this algebra bimodule bundle. All right, so this was the easy version for oriented manifolds, but the same is true for, for non-oriented manifolds. And in the complex case, this is all like so if, if one makes, if one sort of sees what one needs in order to write it, everything is like totally crystal clear. There is, this is like, yeah. So it's, it's a very nice uh, story. And it's also, I think, nice that, I think that this higher structure of two vector bundles relates sort of two lower structures, which is, uh, which is, uh, which, which is, which with each other. That's sort of a nice thing. All right, so my last, point would be um, another um, application to sort of higher spin geometry, which is also called string geometry. So that's, that, goes, that goes back to a, to, a, to, a, to a draft paper by Stolz Teichner that they wrote like um, in 2000, maybe. And they raised the question if 
like a string manifold has like a, what they call a string or bundle. Right, like a spin manifold has a spin or bundle, something that's sort of using the spin structure, combining it with a representation, and then makes this bundle, which like, for example, has an interesting differential operator. And there was, they were wondering if that's true for string manifolds, if there is a generalization of this. And um, so let me just remind that a string manifold is a manifold where uh, the, the, the first the, the first fractional Pontryagin class vanishes. That's like the condition, like for a spin manifold, the stiefel whitney classes vanish. And the, the string manifolds are interesting because they, they are the target spaces, the space times for supersymmetric sigma models that do not have this anomaly, which is represented by this Pfaffian line bundle on the mapping space of surfaces. So, the all, so usually when one writes down this action functional and, and sort of tries to perform this fermionic um, path integral that Ezra, Ezra talked about, I mean exactly this Berezinian integral, then uh, so usually so this integral is not a function but a section in this Pfaffian line bundle. And if the manifold is a string manifold, so it has a chosen string structure, then it's the result of Ulrich Bunke that this string structure trivializes canonically the Pfaffian line bundle so that then the action functional is a complex function and the anomaly is gone. So that's the, important of, the importance of string manifolds. So now we want to assume that we have a string manifold and construct this string or bundle. So this is a theorem that um, goes back to Peter Crystal's PhD thesis and there are a couple of details with this infinite dimensionality like open. So, all right, so let me not further comment this. So, so the, the, claim, the, the claim is, and that, that's gonna be, that's true, that we can construct a string or bundle as an infinite dimensional two vector bundle in a sense of infinite dimensional two vector bundle. I'm not going to explain exactly what this means, but you will see what the problem is. So let's start. So now I will give like an, a really independent example of a two vector bundle, just infinite dimensional. So the surjective submersion of this two vector bundle is the pass vibration. So we consider we need to choose a base point in the manifold. You can like, it's not so nice, but let's, let's accept this. So we choose a base point, consider the set of paths or the, the, the manifold of paths starting at X and the base point projection, all right? So that's the first ingredient. Now, next we need an algebra bundle over this path space, all right? So now everything is infinite dimensional and then one has to say what kind of infinite dimensional thing. So this is a, so it, this is a, what we call, we call a rigged Clifford von Neumann algebra bundle. And it, had, it has a typical fiber, which is like the Clifford algebra of, um, of a space of spinors on the line. And this is like, then we construct a Fox space representation of this and in this Fox space representation, complete this to a, um, to a von Neumann algebra, which gives the type one, type three, one factor. All right, so, and there are some things that I won't explain now, for example, what this rigged means. That's related to our desire that in the end, we want to construct smooth things. So a continuous Clifford algebra bundle or von Neumann algebra bundle wouldn't suffice, I think, because as I said, one is interested in like certain differential operators. So it's important to keep track of the smooth structures. So that's why Peter Christel in his thesis invented, so I think invented this notion of rigged von Neumann algebra bundles, which sort of means that they have like a dense Frechet algebra bundle inside. All right, so and one can like uh, here see like the, the dense Frechet algebra bundle already. All right, so this is the algebra bundle over the pass vibration. And now like the most important point is the bimodule bundle over the double fiber product. So the double fiber product of this pass vibration has like this map to the loop space by just taking two paths which you now because of the fiber product condition end at the same point. So one gets a loop by like running one path and then the other inverse. 
And over the loop space, there is this sort of famous spinor bundle on loop space, which is also like, um, like also appears in this draft paper of Stolz and Teichner. But also Peter Christel in his thesis gives like a very nice and totally rigorous construction of what this um, spinor bundle on the loop space is. And it's again in this sort of rigged setting. It's a rigged Hilbert space bundle. So it's, a, it's in fact a Frechet bundle that fiberwise can be completed to a Hilbert space bundle. And the typical fiber is just this like fermionic Fox space that one gets from um, spinors on the circle. Okay. And the main point that's really the, the main work sort of uh, in relation to this von Neumann algebra is really that we proved that this spinor bundle, which because it's a Fox space, right? It has this Clifford algebra action by a Clifford algebra like over the loops. And then it's sort of the difficult thing is to properly split this or split loops in two halves, get like the two Clifford algebras over paths and have they act from the left and the right on the thing. So that's our main point here. So this spinor bundle on the loop space is a bimodule bundle over the algebras on the two half paths of the loop. That's the main point of the construction and the main ingredient to, to set up this two vector bundle. And finally, there is this intertwiner um, on like the, the threefold fiber product, which looks like this. So three paths with common initial point, common endpoint. And then there is this, this intertwining condition and here uh, we have the confusion product in the middle over taken like over like this is a bimodule, this is a bimodule and the middle, the algebra in the middle is the one um, over the middle path. So this is like, this has been a proposal by Stolz and Teichner in this draft and we have now sort of um, completely um, and rigorously defined this. And the, the sort of the secret of um, getting this, this um, this intertwiner here, so this fusion um, structure, was by combining like this algebraic fusion of Fox spaces that sort of um, like um, is sort of well known, like say from the theory of um, of standard forms of von Neumann algebras. So th it's clear that this Fox space sort of can be fused with itself and gives again the Fox space. But then there is this sort of this this um, this x depending component of the story, and there is. The, this what's called it's also due to Stolz Teichner and the, this geometric fusion on loop spaces uh, and this can be applied to the spinor bundle on loop space and then combining the two things this that this fixes the definition of this intertwiner um, over the double the triple path space and this sort of finishes the construction of uh, of this infinite dimensional of the string or bundle as an infinite dimensional um, two vector bundle. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks a lot. Um, any uh, brief questions for Conrad? Um, may I please? Sure. Yes, well, I have, uh, I have two brief questions. Uh, well, one is non-mathematical, uh, and that is uh, what uh, software and hardware did you <laughs> use to create this wonderful poster to you? Oh, you can read it there on top, I think. It's called Scribble, like Scribble without... Oh, yeah, I can see that now. I you have to buy it. It's seven, seven bucks. I see. Thank you. And the math question is about this last... Uh, construction, uh, well, uh, this infinite dimensional construction, uh, uh, I was just wondering if, uh, uh, if, uh, you know, if one could obtain a finite dimensional version by uh, using a finite dimensional uh, Lie two group model of, of the string, uh, the string two group. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very sure that this is possible, yes, but we haven't, we don't know how to do it yet. Okay. Do you think you, uh, that, that would still take place in the world of two vector bundles or you would have to go higher like three vector bundles or something? No, I believe yeah. that, uh, that there should be a construction that takes, uh, it takes like the, that sort of you, you consider the frame bundle of the manifold 
lift its structure group to the string group, then you have this string bundle over X. And then there should be a construction that associates to this two, bun two principle bundle a kind of representation and exactly sort of spits out this two vector, a finite dimensional version of this two vector bundle. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's true. But there is a long way to go. I because see. There is no theory. There is no theory. I mean, no, I think no sort of appropriate theory for representations of two groups yet, maybe. I, at least I don't know it. And also, like all this, like combining this representation theory with topology or with smooth structures, that's like, yeah, it's still, still work. Yeah. But I think it's, that's exactly the idea. This thing should be associated to the string, the, the string frame bundle of, of X, yes. Thank you. Well, more questions or comments? Uh, yes, a short question maybe. Um, so, so you said in the very beginning as two vector spaces, you always take algebras, bimodules, intertwiners. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think you would get, I mean, more if you would choose a different version of two vect? I mean, say K linear, nice small K linear categories and maps and so on. I mean, the dualizable part is always the same as you mentioned up above. But, uh, but just a dualizable part. I mean, here it also seemed important that you were not talking about what was the abbreviation G, C, S, A bundles, but rather but the, the alpha full algebra bundles and then the sheafification. But that's dualizable, right? So it's all these G, G C, S, A bundles. Uh, they, uh, right. Those they, are dualizable, but I mean, you were saying, I mean, there is, I, I had the feeling there was the sheafification process took you out of there, no? Yeah, well, in the, I mean, the, then the, the question is a bit, I mean, before you go into sheafification, you need to sort of construct these sort of pre-version of two vector bundles where you consider algebra bundles. Now, if you want yes. to replace algebra by some k-linear category, right, I mean, you would have to define like what a k-linear category bundle over Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, yeah. It's I mean, I don't know what that would be, but <laughs> yeah, maybe it's just like an obvious kind of thing. But now to see whether under sheafification, this gets more is like really difficult to say. I don't know it. But I think that given this classification result of the of the two line bundles, where is it here? That I mean, that that was like very satisfying for us. So yes. It, yeah, I, <laughs> I, mean, I agree. I agree. I would just be curious. I mean, what mm. happened otherwise, right? I mean, because actually, actually we were working on it. <laughs> so, so you take. I think the certification is not a not not a big problem. So, so you take what what um what these um, um k linear um category the, the other version um of um, to that and then then you. Um, you build up some uh, representation um, uh, representation theory of two groups, and uh, yeah, exactly like what Claudia said. Like uh, then, then you can well, you can you can build up these two vector bundles by gluing little pieces on each uh, on each uh, um, open set of um, and then um, the gluing procedure is this. Um, Exactly, this certification. Yeah, that that that's possible, mm -hmm. but but I don't know whether whether <laughs> it's going to be equivalent or or. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be interesting to see what happens under the certification, right? Oh, you get the same scary. thing or different things. Yeah. But I agree yeah. that this classification. I mean that you know, that's very satisfying. <laughs> Yes. Thanks for the nice yes. talk. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know about that yet. <laughs> okay. Other questions or comments? So yeah, I have a, um, I guess, a comment followed by a question. The first comment is something that you're probably aware of, namely that by passing to bundles of infinite-dimensional Caesar algebras, um, then uh, that resolves in some sense this need for shiftification, like the, the bundles of algebras that were not there suddenly are there. So you pass to more equivalent bundles of Caesar algebras. Is that, is that, is that sure really? I, that's something I sort of, 
Yeah. yeah. So the, the key words is continuous trace sister algebras, and there is a there is a book called Continuous Trace Sister Algebras where you can learn everything about them if you want. It's 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 been around for quite some time. Um, something that's a bit more recent that's also very interesting, also in the same direction, but a continuation, is the work of Dadarlat and Penich, uh, where they construct uh, bundles of sister algebras that correspond to all higher twists not just oh yeah that's true i know this yeah so have you thought about incorporating those no no i okay that i think this is what i think this would require to go to even higher uh, in category or in vector bundles like to get the higher twists no i think it just means it just means that you need to work with some algebras that are that are no longer the ones that that you've been working with, but they're still just algebras. And... Right. But that's sort of the same, right? Because I mean, for example, when you look at bundle verbs, um, they are like bicategorical nature and they're equivalent to POH bundles, which is like ordinary categories. So by going to the infinite dimensions, you can avoid going to higher categories. I think it's something like this is going on there. Yeah, I think so. Anyways. <laughs> Andre, uh, do, you mean, do you mean this? Uh, the, 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 uh, so instead of homonomy algebra, you work with uh, the category of sister algebras, then helper bimodules, you mean this? Sorry, I, um, so I actually want to ask it seems often to me that uh, the sort of phenomena that Andre mentions that once you go to some sort of infinite dimensional setting, you're able to to capture things that aren't in the Brow group um, is related to the contractibility of the unitary group of Hilbert space, which is kind of out there, but not something algebraists, as far as I know, have access to. Uh, Ezra, we didn't, we didn't hear that well what you were saying. Oh, no. <laughs> OK, I give up then. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I was just saying that it might have something, I mean, that somehow, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, that somehow this seems uh, to me, always to me, and I'm guessing that this has something to do with the contractibility of the unitary group of Hilbert space, which is somehow outside algebra. Anyway, that's just a, a remark on Andre's remark. 